Hi folks, welcome to the September 2007 edition of BirdWise, your local birding show. My name is Phil Kelly, I'm your feather man, and I'll be your host tonight while Tom Schooley is on assignment. In today's show, we'll take a trip to McLean Creek, we'll view a killdeer nest and display, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion about that. Professor Bert Gutman will continue his discussion on avian reproduction. We'll dig into our mailbag and answer another question. We'll have our usual features, including the news, calendar events, and the avian forecast. But first, a word from our sponsor, the Bird of the Month. The Bird of the Month for the month of September is the Cedar Waxwing. Waxwings are medium-sized, berry-eating songbirds who are most closely related to silky flycatchers. There are three species of waxwing worldwide, two of which breed in North America. Their waxwings are widespread throughout the continent and can be found in open woods, hedgerows, and orchards. Waxwings are distinct for their stately upright posture and head crest. They have plump bodies and soft, sleek gray and brown plumage and pointed wings. Waxwings are named for the red waxy droplets on the ends of the secondary flight feathers of adults. Waxwings feed predominantly on sugary fruits, relying almost completely on them for seven months of the year, from fall to early spring. During this time, waxwings occur almost anywhere within their range where they can find fruit crops, including orna ornamental plants. Waxwings typically pluck the whole fruit while perched on a branch, but they may also pluck fruit while hovering. In summer, insects become important in the diet. The cedar waxwing's fondness for the eastern red cedar gave the bird its names. The breeding season for waxwings is among the latest of North American passerines. This is probably due to their midsummer ripening of fruit. Waxwings are gregarious and non-territorial. They form large, non-breeding flocks that search out fruit crops. And now our birdwise education specialist, Professor Bert Gutman, will continue his discussion on avian reproductive strategies. Hi, let me pose a question for you. Why do birds reproduce? For that matter, why do any animals reproduce? Well, you say, of course they reproduce so there can be another generation of birds, another generation to carry on. But that's the way we humans think. Birds don't think that way. Birds don't know anything about generations. They don't know anything about the future. They can't know anything about needing to have more birds so that the species will continue. Well, I want to take the viewpoint of the British biologist Richard Dawkins, who talked about genes, about genes being selfish. The reason birds do anything, the reason they have their structures, the reason they engage in certain activities, is that they have genes that make them do these things, that program them to, behave, to have certain structures and to behave in certain ways. And as Dawkins points out, genes are selfish. The only interest a gene has is in reproducing itself, replicating itself, so that there are more genes in the next generation. And in order to do this, the genes create certain strategies of behavior. The strategy has to overcome certain difficulties, such as energy and timing. It takes a lot of energy to reproduce. Look, for example, at the size of an egg relative to the size of the female that lays it. This picture happens to show a moderately large female, but look how big the egg is relative to her. A smaller bird would have an egg that was even larger fraction of her own weight. And when you consider the clutch of eggs that a female will lay, maybe three to five eggs. The total mass of that clutch could be anywhere from 50 to 80 percent. I've seen figures saying even more than her own weight if she's a little bird and she lays a lot of eggs. So this is an important factor and in order to supply this energy, birds have to have plenty of food. They have to live in an environment and follow feeding strategies that supply all of that food. There's also a question of timing here. For example, consider birds that feed 
on worms such as American robins or European blackbirds that if there's a light winter and an early spring so that the soil is very soft early in the spring and they're able to dig down into the soil and get the worms they need that they will breed earlier or for example uh, insectivorous birds, birds that live on insects will often time their breeding to the time when the insects they feed on are most likely to appear. Uh, another factor is, for example, shown by crossbills. These are red crossbills. These are birds that have these wonderfully crossed tips on the bills. These, the, the tips are adapted for getting the seeds out of cones, such as spruces and pines. But the time of breeding will depend very much on when those cones, when those seeds become available. And we know that the, the breeding time for crossbills can be shifted drastically depending upon when the, the trees around them are able to produce the seeds they need. Some crossbills will even breed during the fall if it happens that there's a good crop of seeds at that time. Well, I want to talk about two general strategies that will show a difference in the way two kinds of birds try to reproduce. Because the birds produce two kinds of young that are called nidifugus or nidiculus. The nitty part of these words, the N-I-D part, refers to the nest. And the F-U-G part in the word nudifugus refers to fleeing or running away. After all, a fugitive is somebody who runs away. And, well, tempus fugit, time flies. Nidifugus young are young that are hatched out with a layer of fluffy feathers, just like chicks. And this is typical of birds like ducks and like uh, pheasants and, and partridges and other chicken-like birds. And almost as soon as the young are hatched, they flee from the nest. And so you see them running around, generally under the supervision of their mother. Now in contrast to this, the nidiculous young are those that are born helpless and often blind. These are the little birds that have to sit in their nest with their wi mouths wide open waiting for their parents to bring them food. And even after they leave the nest, they may be sitting there for a considerable time, needing to be fed by their parents until they're able to learn how to forage for themselves. Well, if you've ever watched a pair of birds flying back and forth to the nest, carrying food to their young, you know that this takes an enormous amount of energy. So this is one strategy for using energy. You put the energy into the adults flying around and getting food for the young. Uh, there will be a clutch of maybe three to five eggs, which will hatch into the same number of young ones. And generally, they're successful in raising those, at least to the point of fledging. But the nidifugus strategy uses a different input of energy. We live on a lake, and we're always delighted in the spring to see the little batches of ducklings going out on the lake with their mothers. But it's kind of sad in a way to watch them over the next couple of weeks and you see that the number of ducklings in a batch will generally be decreasing because there are predators around in the lake that are gobbling up these little guys. And so the, in the nidifugus strategy, the energy goes into producing a lot of eggs. These are generally birds that have very large clutches. And of course, they produce a lot of young ones, but many of those young don't survive. Well, I hope that this gives you some additional insight into some of the factors that are involved in birds' reproduction. And so I hope you'll grab your binoculars and go out and Look at these different kinds of birds, I hope, with eyes that are somewhat fresh. For our field trip this month, we're going to visit the beaver ponds out at McLean Creek. This is a great place to go where you really should be able to hear, if not see, a lot of great birds.
McLean Creek is an excellent place not only to see birds but to listen to them. Once there, you'll find an oasis of bird calls and songs with a minimal background noise of highways and lawnmowers. There's a half mile wheelchair accessible loop around a beaver pond. You can extend the hike to another half mile by taking a path deeper into the woods where mixed conifers and deciduous trees tower over your head. The trails are great fun for children with boardwalks and bridges over McLean Creek and a natural tunnel through the root network of an ancient cedar. This wonderful mix of water and woods brings out a range of birds that are a treat for the eyes and the ears. To reach McLean Creek, take Evergreen State College exit from northbound Highway 101, which you may also think of as westbound Highway 101, then take the Mud Bay exit. Go left at the stop sign and left again onto Delphi Road. In 3.4 miles, you will find the McLean Creek Nature Trail sign. And here's Sheila McCartan with our news and calendar of events. Thanks, Phil. Preliminary results from a soon-to-be-released study on marine bird populations in northern Puget Sound indicate steep declines in many key species since the late 1970s. The four-year study conducted by John Bauer, a professor of field biology at Western Washington University, included a census of 80 North Puget Sound marine bird species, those that live in the water, not just on the shore. Students gathered data from about 150 sites between Saswan in British Columbia and Whidbey Island. Bauer's study compares the latest numbers with data collected between 1978 and 1979 when the construction of oil refineries in the region prompted the federal government to conduct marine species studies in the area that could be harmed by an oil spill. Some of the species data include the common mirror, a long-billed black and white seabird whose population has declined 93 percent since the 1970 census, and the western grebe, a long-necked black and white seabird which has seen its numbers drop 81 percent. Other birds in decline include the brant, a coastal goose common on Padilla Bay, and the scoter, a sea duck that is a popular catch for hunters. The study seems to confirm early results from bird counts by the State Department of Fish and Wildlife. The most probable causes for the decline, according to Bauer, are water pollution, eelgrass destruction, global warming, and habitat loss. In addition to government restrictions on shoreline development, he said individuals can do a lot to help the birds by limiting pollution and not allowing their dogs to serve birds while walking on the beach. And now for the calendar. On Saturday, September 8th, join a Black Hills Audubon field trip to see migration on the coast. This all-day trip, led by Phil Kelly, will travel to the Washington coast with stops at Johns River Wildlife Area, Bottle Beach, Westport, Midway Beach, and end in Tokeland. Phil hopes to see lots of migrating shorebirds, other fall visitors, and resident birds. Call Phil at 459-1499 to register. 
on Saturday, September 29th, join an all-day trip to the coast with trip leader Scott Morrison. This is pretty much the same route as Phil's trip, but see what a difference three weeks can make. At this later date, there should be late migrants, godwits in the harbor, and the first wintering birds in the area. Call Scott at 412-1260 to sign up. On Saturday, October 13th, the Black Hills Audubon field trip will go to a completely different area while exploring Capitol Forest. Field trip leaders Jim Presky and Lonnie Somner will spend the day exploring Capitol Forest to see what birds might be there at this time of year. Gray jays and mountain quail are residents, as are woodland birds. Call the Black Hills Audubon Society office at 352-7299 to register. Mark your calendars for the annual fall bird feeder cleaning on October 6th. Cleaning your bird feeders is especially important in preventing deaths of songbirds from bacteria buildup in your feeder. Black Hills Audubon Society members will clean your feeder for just $5, slightly more if you have a large or especially dirty feeder, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at Wild Birds Unlimited on Cooper Point Road. Drop off your feeder and pick it up later that afternoon. Proceeds from this event go to maintaining the chapter's conservation and education work. Volunteers are still needed to help clean that day. If you can spare any amount of time and wish to mingle with fellow bird lovers, please call Deborah Nickerson at 754-5397. We'll end our report today with Birdwise Featherman Phil Kelly. Phil, what's going to be happening in September? Thank you, Sheila. The feather report for September is kind of a mixed bag. And I, by sense, I say it's a mixed bag, and a lot of the colorful passerines that we had, the songbirds that were here in the spring and summer, are migrating, and we're going to be losing them. The good side of things is shorebird migration is pretty much in full swing. So all those birds that we saw in April and May that were migrating up to the tundra to nest are now migrating back towards South America. And there are some really nice concentrations of a wide variety of shorebirds down at the coast. There are a lot down at Nisqually Wildlife Refuge on the mud flats there. There should be at McLean Creek uh, is another area. Uh, out toward Shelton, there are some mud flats out there that will host some really good numbers of western sandpipers, least sandpipers, greater and lesser yellow legs, long billed, short billed dowagers. Down on the coast, you'll find larger shorebirds like marbled godwits. There's been reports of a couple of bar-tailed godwits down at Toakland. There'll be willets, wimbrels, just a really, really nice collection of birds. And there have been reports of a few oddities in the shorebird family uh, here at Nisqually and in other areas along the coast, including stilt sandpipers, uh, semi-palmated sandpipers, bared sandpipers. So it's a great time to grab your binoculars Get out there and look for some of these mud flats and these low spots during the tides and get out and look at these birds. This spring, down at Capitol Lake near Water Street, while the ground crew was struggling to get grass to grow, a pair of killdeer had growing plans of their own. In spite of the fact that the nest was by a service road that saw both vehicular and pedestrian traffic all day long. The temporary fencing put up to protect the grass also served to protect the killdeer nest, at least for a while. Once the fence came down, our killdeer couple found that they had asphalt front property, forcing them to work overtime, conducting the killdeer broken wing displays on a regular basis. If you'll note, the nest has the standard four killdeer eggs in a clutch. Now here's the killdeer parent starting its distraction, calling out to what it, it appears to be a threat to its nest. It leaves the nest and creates a distraction. Look at me, follow me. The voice getting more intense the closer the intruder comes to the nest.
Now you'll note the broken wing display. After the thread is gone, the killdeer carefully returns to the nest. Notice how close this nest is to activity, and yet it was able to complete hatching and raise four young. And the young were seen around the nest for a short time after they hatched. Here's Dennis Paulson to elaborate a bit more on the nesting and fledging process. Uh, they, they almost always lay four eggs in their clutch, at least the northerly breeding ones lay four eggs, and they actually fit together very nicely because of their shape, four of them, and the, the uh, bird that incubates, whether it's a male or female, can get all four of these very large eggs uh, under its, in, its, in its brood patches. We have one brood patch on either side, two eggs on either side of the body, of the belly, and they lay eggs that are very, very large for the size of the bird. Each egg could represent as much as 20% of the female's weight. And so the reason they lay such relatively large eggs, of course, is because so, so the chicks can develop uh, very far along within the egg. And when the egg hatches, the chick comes out and then it's actually got feathers already. And within six or eight or 15 hours, it dries off and it can actually start running around itself. It's a precocial chick. Uh, shorebird babies, many of them breed at high latitudes where it's very cool or cold. Uh, and they don't uh, regulate their own temperature very effectively right at first, so the adults have to brood them. And so even though they can run around and feed themselves, they get cold fairly easily. So at intervals, as soon as they start cooling down, they run right back to the adult and snuggle up underneath the adult's feathers and are brooded for a while, warmed up again, then they can go out on their own. Killdeer are notorious for putting their, their nest in what we would consider unlikely spots. They've nested in the grass islands, in the parking lot at Nisqually Wildlife Refuge last year. In my neighborhood, a typical subdivision, we have an open park, killdeer will nest there in spite of the fact that there are people playing, kids playing sports out there and dogs running around and whatnot. They managed to nest and successfully raise their young. The broken wing display that the killdeer have to, to lead to lead intruders or threats away from the nest site is specific to that particular bird, but many other birds do a display of sorts, particularly ground nesters, will do a, a display of sorts to, to lead a predator away from the nest site. We reach into the mailbag this month, and the question is an email question that came in. Uh, somebody was walking around Capitol Lake, and they want to know what happened to all the male mallards. Well, the male mallards are still around. If you remember the discussion that uh, Professor Gutman had last month on molt, the male mallards are, in essence, changing their clothes. The, the, the old feathers they used in the spring during breeding season get pretty well beat up and worn out. They're growing a new suit of clothes. They're in molt right now. And at the start of molt, they're very drab. Give them another couple of weeks or a month or so and they'll be back to their normal glorious colors. They haven't gone anywhere. They've just, they're just in the process of molting into new feathers. Now, if you have a question or comment, please email us at tctv birdwise at yahoo.com. Folks, I'd like to thank you for watching this month's show. Uh, I hope you've learned something. Uh, as we close, Sheila McCartan is going to read uh, a piece done by William Leon Dawson about the cedar bird. Now, this piece was done over 100 years ago, and the cedar bird in this essay refers to our bird of the month, the cedar waxwing. One does not care to commit himself in precise language upon the range of the cedar bird 
or to predict that it will be found at any given spot in a given season. The fact is, cedar birds are gypsies of the feathered kind. There are always some of them about somewhere, but their comings and goings are not according to any fixed law. A company of cedar birds may throng the rowan trees in your front yard some bleak December day. They may nest in your orchard the following July, and you may not see them on your premises again for years, unless you keep cherry trees. It must be confessed that the cedar bird has a single passion, a consuming desire for cherries. Feast your eyes upon him, those marvelous melting browns, those shifting saffrons and Quaker drabs, those red sealing wax tips on the wing quills. The cedar bird, being so singularly endowed with the gift of beauty, is denied the gift of song. He is, in fact, most nearly voiceless, his sole note being a high-pitched, sibilant squeak. Indeed, so high-pitched is this extraordinary note that many people cannot hear them at all, even when the wax wings are squeaking all about them. <laughs>